Don't get me wrong. I mean, the Cascadius is, is 40, 50% of the entire market. So it's a damn good truck. You can find parts in every corner of the, of the country. So it is a good truck, but unfortunately, the, the the guy that makes the rules, like they say, is the whoever holds the gold makes the rules. You know. That's right. That's and right. Banks, uh, they don't want to finance assets that depreciate fast. You know. What's going on, mother truckers? Welcome to the Asian My Show. If you're new to trucking, consider subscribing to this channel. My name's Alex. Today we got a special guest. Thank you so much, Bruno, for being on the show. So many of you, you never get the chance to actually see behind the scenes. Today we are with the owner of East Harbor, and he's the actual bank, guys. Like, no BS. People don't get a chance to talk to people that make decisions. So today we're here and we're talking to you, Bruno. So thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having us here. I mean, we've been doing this for for about ten years now, and we're uh, I'm curious to see what kind of questions there's out there regarding uh, financing and you know getting uh, new customers into trucks. What sets you apart from other banks? So we we don't compete directly with the banks. You know, the big banks in this industry are going to be the Hitachi's, the Wells Fargo's, uh, U.S. banks. Uh, we don't compete with them because those guys are looking for major transport companies you know they don't care about giving one truck to one owner operator they're, they're looking for the big fish mm. so they're going out there for transport companies that have over 100 trucks in their fleet you know that's really where the majority of, of the deals that banks want are you know no that's the damn truth because i'll be honest guys i walked into a bank of america my dumb ass walked into a bank of america nine years ago trying to buy a damn truck I was like, I'm just trying to buy a truck that's like 30 grand and they're like, uh, what's your net worth? Net worth, what does that mean? And, uh, a Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Hitachi, all these banks have separate departments that are not in a local branch. They're in some corporate building elsewhere and they dedicate just trucking. You know, there's trucking, there's construction, there's aviation, there's, uh, you know, uh, yachting. The, the, every industry has its own departments, but you won't see it at a local branch. You know, the local branch, they're looking for loans over a million bucks, you know. Yeah. All right, Bruno. So let's talk about the myths about getting getting a loan. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, one of the common ones that I've seen out there is that you can get into a truck as a startup with very little down. I've seen some advertising, you know, on, on areas like truck paper where you can come in with uh, with 5,000. And, and the percentage doesn't matter because you can find a $10,000 truck Say you're coming up with 40% down and it's 4,000, it's just not gonna get done, you know? I mean, for us, for instance, repo costs are somewhere in that 10, 12,000 range uh, between uh, losing about two, three months uh, of payments that we, we realize we need to repo this truck. You got a repo man that comes in there, it's probably about a thousand bucks. Then you gotta transport it back to wherever you wanna get it to, where it's a location uh, of an auction or a dealership. Uh, then you need to bring it into your shop, you need to change tires because I'll tell you right now, I've never had a repo where tires came back new. <laughs> they were <you> know? perfect? <laughs> the he put on new Michelins? Paying, yeah, the, the guy is not paying his truck, he's not changing the oil, he's not fixing the tires. Right. He knows that any day now somebody's going to come and pick up his truck. Right. So you get that truck, once you bring it into the dealer, in our case we bring it back uh, to a dealer, uh, then you got to refurbish it, you got to change tires, you got to put brakes, you got to make it DOT. That's assuming that you don't have any major uh, dam uh, component damage, you know, uh, transmission, differentials, you got to... Uh, the DPFs that generally have, uh, they're blinking, you know, and they, they don't do anything about it. Um, then you have to remarket the truck. You have to wait another three to six months to sell it. You got to pay a sales commission. So that whole process is ten to $12,000 per truck. Per truck. Right. So you could, you could take a L, a big loss, and that risk is really about $12,000. Correct. In our so, case, in our, in our funding uh, scenario, you know, I'm sure there's banks out there, they do zero down, but... But the default rates that they have, I mean, they, they, they make sure that you're a six, seven year higher, you've been three years in business, you know, you're buying a new vehicle or, or sometimes they'll do older stuff, but but they vetted you. I mean, you're talking about A right. credit, B plus, like the, the cream of the crop, you know, not, right, not right. the kind of drivers that are starting out, you know. Right. We want to make sure these trucks, if something does happen to them, right. we can afford to put that kind of money into them and it'll build the value of the truck. I don't see that happening in this market in Freightliners, Internationals, or Volvos. I see that, mo again, another point to, to the Kenworth St. Peter bills. You can do that and the value will go up. People want to run these trucks three or four more years, you know? People really want to know the guidelines and what it takes to get into a truck. Well, it depends on the risk. I mean, uh, you got guys out there like Dakota doing 50% uh, down deals and that's a no brainer, you know? As long as you got a good asset uh, that is not old, uh, not likely to blow an engine. 
but uh, it, it depends on uh, several things, you know, three or four different things. Number one is going to be the collateral of the truck. Then number two is the likelihood of default. Uh, where are you going to pick that truck up in the country yeah. and, and then finally how are you going to liquidate this asset when it comes back you know so these are the kind of things that we look for as a finance company. Does the brand of truck matter? Yeah absolutely. So some brands like Peterbilt and Kenworth specifically classics don't depreciate very much since there's only limited manufacturing uh, they're very expensive trucks so you're not going to see uh, you know the big companies like JB Hunt or any of these uh, big transport companies that they're not going to get all the bells and whistles. Right. Um, so they make them limited for the truck drivers that want them and then what happens is there's a lot more truckers that really want these kind of trucks but don't have the money to pay them new so then they'll go to the sales to use market. Once we buy those trucks they don't depreciate much and they're very highly remarketable. So if we finance them and they come back you know we find buyers for them like this as opposed to a, a Cascadia there's a million of them out there you know the Pro Stars for International or the Volvo 670s. Uh, yeah, we could finance them. There's no problem. But the problem is that when a truck comes back, now we're competing with another, you know, hundred uh, Freightliner Cascadias that also need to sell. You know, don't get me wrong. I mean, the Cascadias is is 40, 50 percent of the entire market. So it's a damn good truck. You can find parts in every corner of the of the country. So it is a good truck. But unfortunately, the the, the guy that makes the rules, like they say, is the whoever holds the gold makes the rules. You know, that's right. That's and right. Banks uh, they don't want to finance assets that depreciate fast. You know. So I don't know what it is. Generally, truck drivers are going to try to get into the cheapest truck they can find. Therefore, they get into the Cascadias when they buy new as a big transporter, where they, with uh, owner operators that are trying to start. You know, you can get a used truck for for twenty five, thirty five, forty five thousand on a decent year with around five, four, five hundred thousand miles, six hundred thousand miles. So that's where the truckers are going. You know, right? But as a bank, we that's already a, a depreciated truck. It, it's got almost no value. We don't want to be financing those things. What would be the perfect truck? for us to try to get so that we have the best chance of getting that loan approved. What would you recommend? For, for the lowest uh, LTV, the, the issue is there's, there's two sides of the equation. Number one, uh, the higher the price of the truck, the more comfortable the bank is. In my case, for instance, as a subprime kind of lender, uh, for the reason is that the customer's coming up with a bigger down payment. So an example, on a 25% on a down payment on a $40,000 truck, it's only 10 grand. So a, a guy that's buying a hundred thousand dollar truck, yeah, you got more risk in him, but he's putting twenty five thousand dollars down, you know. So you have more buffer in there in case there's a repo, uh, you're remarketing, you want to sell it at auction. There's there's room for for error. Um, mm -hmm. On the on the trucks on, on the classic side, you, you're not going to find the good working truck uh, for less than you know fifty fifty five thousand sixty. That's kind of like the rock bottom, as opposed to the Cascadias, which you can find. Uh, I mean, in today's market. Uh, you can find a 2016 with four or five hundred thousand miles. You can find it for thirty-five thousand. You know, right, right, five forty. So you're you're paying a premium to get into a classic. Therefore, your down payment will probably be higher, but your chance of approval will be better. And if things don't work out, you know, you could always remarket that truck, sell it, and get out of the business. You don't have to. You don't have to go bankrupt. It's better to have good credit or be a homeowner. Uh, well, I'll tell you right now, you're not going to be a homeowner without good credit. Uh, banks, uh, they, they don't take anybody with bad credit. Now, you could have had good credit at some point. Uh, you got a loan and then your credit went bad. Uh, that's what really lenders like us see, you know. Uh, we like the fact that homeowners out there have, have had a proven, uh, they, they've had a time where they've proven to the bank that they could obtain this loan. So at some point in their life, they've had a good credit, they've reported income, they've had income, you know, the bank has considered that they had enough cash flow in their, in their uh, and their job or business to pay for that house. Uh, they're stable, you know, they, they can make monthly payments. That, those are all the kind of things that banks look for because they have less than 1% uh, you know, re repo rates, you know. So right. when we see a guy has, a, has had a home uh, before or currently has a home, we think this guy is, uh, he's, more, he's more reliable than the average guy out there, you know. At the end of the day, Bruno, since you and I are friends now, if someone from my show, right, calls or needs more information about this because when we try to talk to a bank it's very hard to talk to a bank we don't even have access to talk to a bank and now that i'm at a level where i can make friends with people that own banks you know do you think that uh you might at least take a second look at one of my subscribers yeah, yeah absolutely i mean look in the banking world you you never meet the guy that makes the decisions the bank owners don't even see the deals they have loan committees 
uh, that's after the underwriter has uh, written, you know, signed off on a good transaction. And the owner of the bank, he never even sees these things. You know, he just kind of like sits down and puts the guidelines through this whole thing. They have to make very safe deals, and sometimes they've gotten out of control. But but you'll never meet a guy that writes you a check in a bank level. You know. I hear you. So from what I hear from that, guys and gals, it sounds like we got a new plug here. So if you guys have any questions at all and just want straight to the source, man, you guys could reach out to me and I'll get you. I'm not gonna put uh, Bruno's information just straight out there just like that, but um, it sounds like he's willing to plug us. So I appreciate you for being on the show, bro. Yeah, man, thank you. Hell yeah, man. Me.